There's a variety of different artists who both past and present have been sort of leading artists in their day and have an ongoing reputation. This mine was deeper underground than Snaefell is high above ground to give it some sense of uh, the scale of what we're talking about, the depth of this mine. And they're using explosives. They're blasting out rock using gunpowder. The ants and the bee went deep into the mine and were used to haul trains of ore from underground to where we're standing now, which is the washing floors. And this is where the lead and zinc ore that was mined was washed, cleaned and sent off down to the harbour to be shipped away for sale. Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of Exploring Island Heritage. Today we're finding out more about some of the island's industrial history and some of the notable Manx-born artists featured in the National Art Collection. First, we head to Laxey to meet Curator of Social History for Manx National Heritage, Matthew Richardson, at the foot of the Great Laxey Wheel. It was built essentially to pump water out of the lead mines. The whole of this valley sits on a very rich seam of zinc and lead, and these, in the 19th century, were very important metals for Britain as it emerged from the Industrial Revolution, became a world industrial power, these two metals are absolutely crucial for the construction industry, building, and of course the great all-purpose metal of the Victorian age was brass. Brass was used for everything, from door handles to cartridge cases to you name it. And a key ingredient of brass is zinc. So these two metals that were coming out of the ground here were major planks in the Manx economy in the 19th century. The three big planks of the, of the Manx economy back then were tourism, of course, which was a, a major thing. Fishing, one of the biggest fishing fleets in the British Isles here, and mining, and the two main mining sites were Laxey and Foxdale. And were the resources used here, or were they predominantly exported? They were all exported, which we're very, we're very fortunate in the Isle of Man that we don't have any coal. Coal was a key ingredient for smelting the ore, and if you go to places in South Wales where the ore was smelted, they're still recovering from the pollution that that industry caused a hundred odd years down the line. So at the time, it maybe it was seen as a disadvantage that the ore had to be shipped off the island to be processed, but today we've got reason to be thankful for it. And how long was that industry dominant in the Isle of Man? Well, it really, really, it, it got going in the 1840s, really, as a, as a serious industry when technology caught up with the good ore was at a certain depth. You could get a quantity from the top layers just by digging shallow pits. That had been done in the 1790s. They'd more or less exhausted that. But by the 1840s, you'd got pumping systems and lift shafts and things like that, which meant you could access the lower levels where the really big seams were. So 1840s, it really starts to gear up. And the Laxey wheel finally stopped turning in 1929. The, the industry was finally killed off by cheaper imports from other parts of the world, notably Australia, where they could mine zinc in these vast open cast mines, ship it to Europe and still undercut the cost of the zinc that was being produced in mines like Laxey. So it was an industry that lasted probably less than 100 years, if you really were talking about the key years. And was it a slow wind down or was it fairly abrupt? Foxdale it ended fairly swiftly, it ended before the First World War at Foxdale. Laxey staggered on a little bit longer um, and there were various reasons for that, one of which was the First World War, which um, produced a temporary blip in that of course there would be a sudden upsurge in demand for metals for munitions and at the same time the British government was pouring money into industry to keep the miners at their work so that temporary blip kept the Laxey wheel and the Laxey mine going probably a little bit longer than they would ordinarily have done but as soon as those subsidies were withdrawn after the First World War it was um, a pretty steady downward decline. And that must have had quite an influence on the Isle of Man. I mean you say it was one of the, the key planks of the economy. I mean, yeah. I mean how did the island recover from that? By exporting people. As the mines went into abeyance and the writing was on the wall for Laxey probably from about 1910, 1911 onwards with the, the closure of Foxdale. Manx people started leaving and they'd got a skill that they could transfer around the world. Laxey miners turn up in hard rock mines all over the place, Australia and particularly South Africa. The Manx link with South Africa is very much based on mining and we have countless examples of Manxmen from the Laxey London area who've honed their skills in the mines here and have gone to South Africa to make a career for themselves, got quite high up the tree in South Africa's mine captains and the Transvaal Manx Association was very very important in the 1890s up to the early years of the 20th century and it was almost exclusively Manx people who'd come to work in the mines, the diamond mines and the gold mines of the Transvaal. 
And if we have a look at the structure, it's impressive. Yes, well, it's as well as a functional item, it's a visual statement. Don't forget it was built by George Dumble, very powerful, fiery businessman, one of the big icons of the Isle of Man in the, in the middle years of the 19th century. And he wanted the wheel to be a statement. He was chairman of the mining company. He could have built it for much further up the valley where the, the tea rocker is. It would have been an easier prospect for him to avoid all these arches which carry the, the, the rod ducts. He didn't need to do that, but he built it here and the situation that we find it today so that it could be seen from the valley, so that it could be seen from the village. And he wanted it to be seen as a statement of his power. It's also very typical of the, this Victorian attitude that uh, nature was there to be conquered. If you look at some of the great Victorian industrial pieces of archaeology, the Ribblehead Viaduct, for example, on Settles Carlisle Railway, it straddles an area of outstanding natural beauty. And the Victorians, they had this idea that God had placed them on Earth to conquer nature, and that's what they set out to do. You know, they, they, they were brimming with confidence, the Victorians, that they could, they could overcome these natural obstacles. So it's, it, it fits very well into that sort of pattern of thought that the Victorians had, their sense of place you know, in the world, that they'd been placed here by God to, to achieve great things. So it fits into all of those ideas. Are we going to have a look at it? Yeah. So how does it work? How does it operate? So it's all done on gravity. Further up the valley is a system which collects water from all the surrounding hillsides and there's a very elaborate system of what are called lades which feed rainwater from various hillsides into one place and that system only needs to be slightly higher than the top of the wheel for gravity to take effect and the underground tube carries the water down up and inside up to the top of the wheel and forces it out onto the top of the wheel and turns the wheel. So it's, it's again it's a, it's a very clever piece of um, Victorian engineering it's it's beautifully simple deceptively simple the concept you know and it makes use of the natural environment and the natural resources to produce something that is almost totally you know environmentally neutral and, and, and stable the only slight downside to it is if we get a very dry summer then there isn't enough water pressure to keep the wheel turning so that's the only the only sort of caveat with it really so when it stopped being used in anger, if you like, yeah. what happened to it? Well, it was scheduled for the scrapyards, um, and that is in fact what happened to most of the equipment from the mining company. When the mines closed, I mean, all of the equipment that was down in Laxey Village, on the washing floors, that was all scrapped. Other equipment here in the valleys was scrapped. I mean, a lot of people think that um, the two buildings that you can see further up the valley, which are now in a state of ruin, a lot of people think they've been like that for... Um, you know many many hundreds of years they haven't they were literally the roofs were taken off them for scrap and that was done in, almost within living memory when the mine ceased to be and it was only one man one laxi man edwin neal uh, who had the vision i mean the laxi wheel was already a big tourist draw and edwin neal could see that firstly it needed to be preserved in its own right but secondly he thought if this is such a good tourist attraction it should continue to be so so he first took a lease out on it and then purchased it and ran it as his own going concern for many, many years, till eventually it passed into the hands of the Isle of Man government. And it's really fair to say, if Mr. Neil hadn't stepped in at that crucial moment, I don't think the wheel would be here today. How much maintenance does it take? I mean, we know a few oh, years ago it was yeah. painted. Yeah, maintenance is a, an ongoing issue with something this size. It's been likened to the painting of the fourth bridge. You know, it, it's um, every few years we'll have a major a major renovation scheme on it you know in a few years I think the last big one we had was probably 2004 when we had so much scaffolding I think we'd used every piece of scaffolding available on the Isle of Man at that particular time the whole thing was swathed in scaffolding we had specialist restoration companies come across from the UK to advise us on different techniques we had extensive research done into the right type of paint because you can't just slap any old any old emulsion on this it's limestone it has to be allowed to breathe if you use the wrong paint you're effectively trapping water in the bricks, which is very, very bad for them. So all of this had to be taken into consideration. We had to strip off all previous layers of paint, apply paint that was sympathetic to the stonework. Similarly, we had to do uh, work on the, on the timbers to check which timbers were structurally sound and which weren't. I think we removed three of the major uprights which hold the top platform. And the timbers for those are so large that we could only source them in the UK and they came from a mill which was being 
uh, decommissioned in Yorkshire, I think, and they had to be specially brought over by the steam packer company on a special shipment because they are so large that there was no other way of getting them to the Isle of Man. But those timbers replaced the three that were found to be structurally unsound when we did that survey back in uh, 2004. So a major, major overhaul took place then, and that will keep us going for a, a good number of years with only minor interventions now and again as we need them. It is a very large structure. Yeah. Well, the reason it's so large is um, because, of course, coal doesn't occur in the Isle of Man. So the engineers of the mine, various mining companies in the valley had been using water wheels as the natural way to get water. It was a very efficient way to pump the mines. Um, but whereas in England in the 1840s, 1850s, steam power took over from water wheels, they had access to a ready supply of coal. We didn't. So it was too expensive to import coal. So you get a situation in the Isle of Man where engineers just keep going for bigger and bigger and bigger water wheels, which is why you end up with the Laxey wheel, which is reputedly the largest water wheel in the world. Yeah, so the diameter of the wheel is famously 72 feet. It's this that makes it the largest water, water wheel in the world, certainly the largest working water wheel. And you get quite a view from the top of it, quite, oh, yeah, quite a view yeah, out there. Yeah, you get a fantastic panorama of the valley, and it's quite a good way to get a sense of the, the way this whole, I mean it's very sleepy these days you know with just a few sheep there and very quiet but from the top you can sort of imagine what it must have been like when it was full of bustle you know and lots of activity, uh, the small engines carrying the ore out of the mine, going down to the village where the machinery would have been operating 24 hours a day, crushing the, the ore, it being shipped down to the harbour, ships coming into the harbour to transport it out to South Wales to be smelted. There would have been smoke, you know, there would have been chimneys, would have been a very, very busy scene, very different to what we see today. And what was life like for people who were involved in that industry? It was hard, there's no two ways about it. It was a very dangerous, very, very dangerous occupation. And you're going down underground on a series of ladders or perhaps the man engine which is a not a cage system as such but a system of platforms which move up and down which you step on and off in order to get down to the lower levels you know they're going down something like 2,000 feet they, this mine was deeper underground than Snaefell is high above ground to give it some sense of uh, the scale of what we're talking about the depth of this mine and those miners might take half an hour to get to the lowest levels that they were working before they even started work you know and when they're down there they're working in damp, wet conditions, total darkness, unless they've got a candle with them. And they're using explosives. They're blasting out rock using gunpowder. It's sort of in these health and safety conscious times, it sort of makes your mind boggle the dangers they were exposed to. And for not a, not a phenomenal amount of pay either. The, the wages weren't great, you know, probably in a subsistence amount that they could just, them and their families could just get by on. What sort of percentage of the population would be involved in that at the time? Um, nearly all, in some way or another. If you look at the census returns for, say, 1881, 1891, for the Laxey Lonnon area, almost every family has got somebody who is involved in mining in some capacity, even if they're not an underground worker, they're a surface worker working on the washing floors, they're a blacksmith working in the mine's yard, they're an engine driver or an engine driver's assistant. In some way or another, almost every family in this locality had an income coming in from the mines. And in terms of the significance of Laxey Wheel, we know it's an attraction here in the Isle of Man, it's, it's you know, being cared for by Manx National Heritage, but on a worldwide stage, what significance does it hold? It's an industrial monument. As I mentioned before, this idea that um, the Victorians had that they could conquer nature and that nature was there to be conquered, I think it's right up there with the, the Rebel Head Viaduct, you know, these, these fantastic Victorian monuments. Certainly in British Isles terms, I think it's in probably, you know, top five, top ten, definitely. Curator of Social History for Manx National Heritage, Matthew Richardson. As we've heard, the Great Laxey Wheel played an integral part in the mining industry in the village. But there's much more to the story, as Laxey historian Andrew Scoff explains. You think of Laxey, you always think of Laxey Wheel and the mines to an extent, but there's a lot of other industrial heritage. If you think about the railways in particular, then of course you've got the smaller operations in comparison to the Laxey Glen Mills and the Woolen Mills and places like that. So yes, it's got a very, very rich... Um, if you look at the wheel as an example, when that industry started, when the mining industry really took off on the Isle of Man, you know, what was it like here in Laxey? It must have been a um, very, very busy place. There was a huge number of people working here at the time. I mean, the population of the island was, I think, it was about 40,000 people at the time. And the mining in this area employed about a thousand people. That's sort of in Laxey and London parishes areas. And then, of course, they've got all the dependents as well. So it must have been um, a thriving community. Hard life, of course, but thriving on a local basis. So we go along here, 
you've seen, I think it was 2004, the Ant and the Bee, the Lexi Mines Railway was reopened. If you're looking at when it was originally here, what did it do? The Ant and the Bee were, um, went deep into the mine and were used to haul trains of ore from underground to where we're standing now, which is the washing floors. And this is where the lead and zinc ore that was mined was washed, cleaned, and sent off down to the harbour to uh, Laxey Harbour to be shipped away for sale. Now that must have been hard graft, basically. Yeah, I think we come down here today with looking at this area from today's viewpoint of a fascinating industrial heritage. But you have to remember, going back to the height of the mines in the 1870s, it really was probably a horrible place to work. People had no alternative; you know, they had to go out and get a job. But they'd be down here five, six days a week, from seven in the morning probably till six at night. No matter what the weather, so it's a nice day today, it'd be quite nice, but middle of winter, freezing cold, pouring with rain, there was no cover, no sheltered working area or anything like that, so it must have been a real hard life. It must have been a very busy place as well. It would have been. Um, the area which we're in now, which now known as the Valley Gardens, there's probably about 300 to 400 people working here in the 1870s over, over two shifts at one point, but probably... I would think there's few other places in the Isle of Man that had a, such a concentration of workforce in such a relatively small area, so it must have been a really, really busy place. In this area, there was at least five water wheels working all the time. If we look down below us, it's hard to imagine what it would have been like. It certainly is. I mean, it's been restored, if that's the correct word, as a sort of a public area and gardens now, but um, in its heyday, it literally was. Every square foot of area was crammed with machinery because it's... The area is bordered on two sides by the valley sides and the river and then the roadway behind us. There was very little working area, flat area in the valley, so every sort of square foot of space, was something was in it, to mining machinery. It finally closed in, in 1929, as the Laxey Wheel song tells us, but there was a little bit of mining on in the, last, in the, the following year, until about March 1930, when it actually finally stopped. So that was 150 years of history gone. And what replaced it? Tourism, fortunately, because the Manx Electric Railway arrived at Laxey in 1894, just as the mine was really going into one of its sort of final phases. Railway was an incredible success in its peak in the first sort of year, when it was a new novelty sort of line. It was bringing a 1,000 people a day. So instantly those people came to Laxey with spending money to, to spend in the local businesses. So where we were losing out with the mining contract and tourism started, um, really take off. We've come down to the MER station. It's been refurbished in recent times. But tell me a little bit about the history of, of this area and what it meant for Laxey. You mentioned the boost in tourism it provided. The area we're standing in now, Laxey Station's got um, a, a very interesting history in itself. We're standing in what was once the gardens of the mine's captain's house, which is now the mine's tavern. We've got the Christ Church behind us as well, which was built at the bottom of the lawns from Captain Rowe's house. I've often sort of said that today you, you look at Laxey Station, it fits in so well with the history of the village that you can't really imagine it being located anywhere else, but the railway company had a lot of problem trying to find a location in Laxey for its station. There was a lot of head scratching as, as to where to build it. One of the first proposals to get the line through Laxey and onto Ramsey, and it was extended to Ramsey in 1898, was to actually build a tunnel underneath the, the village and bring the line through like what they called a subway and then a very, very steep gradient to build the first station on at the bottom of Mines Road. That, I suppose, um, when you think about it, was a bit of a daft idea and it was quickly re rejected and there was a lot of head scratching. But eventually the railway company managed to, to buy part of the, well, all of the, the mine captain's garden and had to demolish part of the, the building, which is the mound, now the mine's tavern, to get the trams passed and on, onwards through Laxey to Ramsey. Now, it's in a bit of a key location between Douglas and Ramsey. Was it a location in itself that people came to, or were, were people passing through? Well, people come to Laxey to look at the wheel, but also to come here and, and get off at Laxey Station, because it's the starting point of the Snaefell Mountain Railway. So it's a very, very busy station. It's probably still the busiest station on the, on the MER now, or today. But going back, certainly between the two world wars it, it was an incredible place you know two three thousand people a day coming here There'd be trams coming in out of here from all directions every few minutes and um, shunting going back to douglas carrying on to ramsey huge queues of people going off up to snaefell on the snaefell mountain railway it's an incredible site very very busy and that went on from sort of early morning right the way through to 11 o'clock at night right every day throughout the summer can't really imagine it in, in sort of from today's viewpoint but very very busy station 
Laxey historian Andrew Scarf. You're listening to Exploring Island Heritage. Earlier in the series, we heard about the National Art Collection held in the care of Manx National Heritage. And one of the internationally renowned designers and artists featured in that collection is being celebrated at the Manx Museum in a special exhibition. Archibald Knox, artist, designer, teacher, aims to showcase all aspects of the artist's talents, including his designs for liberty, paintings and sketches. Organised by the Archibald Knox Forum, it's situated in the Cabinet of Curiosities at the Manx Museum. Chris Hobdell is co-founder of the Forum. If I take you to this one first, it's a small silver dish and it belongs to a private collection up in Solby. He lived there from 1902 to 1905. It's a beautiful silver dish. It actually has Solby embossed on it and a beautiful fire opal, which if you change angle, changes colour. That was discovered in March 2017. It's obviously been there in the collection, but people had forgotten who it was by. And when I saw it, I, well, my hair just stood up on end, and I haven't got a lot, but it definitely stood on end. And I had it authenticated, and it's Liberty & Co, 1904, absolutely stunning. Another one is this beautiful bronze. It's a sundial pointer or nomen, or nomen. It was only discovered March this year, and we're really privileged to have it on display here. And if you look on either side, it's meant to be mounted vertically like it is in the cabinet. You have Archibald Knox, 1905, and on this side you have JC and WJA. That is Joseph Cannell, who actually cast the piece, and Wilson James Ashburner, very good friend of Archibald Knox, was also a designer. And between them, they came up with this wonderful design which I think are the sales of a Manx Nobby. And all of these designs were done in a fairly short period of time, a short part of Knox's career. Yes. Most of the things on display here are between 1898 and 1905-6, which is a fifth small part of his life, but it was at that time that he was doing these designs, some in London, but an awful lot of them up in his cottage and studio in Sulby. So they have a special resonance with the Isle of Man, and it's wonderful to think how much he has been inspired by the culture, history, and scenery of this island in all this work. Now, internationally, Knox would be known as a designer. What we're looking at in this cabinet would be what people would associate with him. But here on the island, he's known for much more than that, and you've tried to showcase that in the exhibition as well. Yes. What I'd love is for everybody in the world to come over and find out bits about Knox they didn't know. Six months ago, I didn't know Knox took photographs. Whether people knew that he'd done designs for carpets, whether people across from the Isle of Man know that he did gravestones, war memorials, oil painting. It's just incredible, the breadth of the man. And then we have a special little section on the Knox Guild of Design and Craft, which was set up by his pupils when he left London in 1912. It ran for 25 years, but on the wall it tells you how he taught, what his principles were. Other things are his sketches, which people away from the Isle of Man are probably not aware of, are the wonderful illustrations and illuminated illustrations culminating in his work on the Deer's Cry, which we have two sample pages on the wall just to show the intricacy and just... It's a work done by angels, somebody said. Co-founder of the Archibald Knox Forum, Chris Hobdell. And that exhibition will be on display in the Cabinet of Curiosities at the Manx Museum until January the 13th next year. And there's a special programme of events taking place to accompany that exhibition. You can find out all the details on the Manx National Heritage website. But which Manx-born artists featured in the National Art Collection, including Knox, stand out? Yvonne Cresswell is Curator of Social History for Manx National Heritage and has responsibility for curating the National Art Collection. I mean, I would say that, the, in a sense, the big names historically would be John Miller Nicholson. To my mind, the greatest British Impressionist artist that nobody really knows about outside the Isle of Man. I mean, there's various works here that I always joke I could take them into the National Gallery in London 
and sneak them in amongst the French Impressionist work and nobody, or post-Impressionist, and nobody would be able to say it wasn't done by one of the leading artists. There's one particular painting where I think I could actually get it into the Louvre and nobody could tell the difference. You then have Archibald Knox, who, although now people are beginning to know his name, for decades nobody would have known his name off the island, but most people in Britain would have recognised his work with the metal work that he did for Liberty. So those are, in a sense, the two big Manx names. You then have William Hoggart, who during his lifetime was a very popular British artist. He was collected by the Queen's parents. So King George and Queen Elizabeth collected works by William Hoggart. So, you know, in the sort of 30s, 40s, 50s, he was a, a very popular artist in Britain. You then have a lot, I mean, what fascinates me is the number of contemporary artists who are leading, you know, artists, sculptors in a contemporary sense and are known internationally. So you have people like Michael Sandor, Brian Neal, Chris Killip, so and a variety of others such as Kevin Atherton. So there's a variety of different artists who both past and present have been sort of leading artists in their day and have an ongoing reputation. Curator of Social History for Max National Heritage, Yvonne Cresswell. That's it for this week's programme. We'll be exploring more island heritage at the same time next week. <laughs>